This is part two of our video on simplifying voltage drop. We've been asked a few times to explain what happens to the watts when a circuit experiences voltage drop. And so, in this video from Learn Electrics, we will go back to basics and look at what happens to the voltage in a circuit and, just as important, especially for understanding why these things happen. So, let's answer these questions. How does the voltage drop increase? And what happens to the power if the voltage drop increases? And then, where do the watts go? We will begin with a look at how Ohm's law and power law can tell us what is happening in the circuit or installation. Then, we will use an electric kettle as an example to see just what happens with volts drop and how the watts or power are affected. We can do this with three related scenarios. In scenario number one, the kettle is plugged into a socket close to the consumer unit. This is a short cable run with a correctly sized cable. Then, in scenario two, we will look at how a long cable run with the same correctly sized cable affects the available watts. And finally, for number three, we will plug the kettle into a circuit that has an undersized cable installed to see just how this affects the kettle's performance. So, to begin, let's look at calculating current and power. We have a circuit made up of three resistances in series with the values as shown in ohms and a voltage across the circuit of 24 volts. Basic Ohm's law tells us that the voltage divided by resistance will give us the amps that flow through the circuit. We can add the resistances and get 8 ohms. And then 24 volts divided by 8 ohms gives a current of 3 amps. This 3 amps of current flows through every resistance in the circuit. The same 3 amps flows through the first 2 ohms resistance, through the 4 ohm resistance and then through the final 2 ohms resistance. Each resistance will also have a share of the 24 volts depending on the size of the resistance. The bigger the resistance, the bigger the share of the voltage. These individual voltages can be calculated by multiplying the current by the individual resistance. 3 amps times 2 ohms is 6 volts, 3 amps times 4 ohms is 12 volts, and lastly, 3 times 2 is 6 volts again. Our circuit values now look like this. Now that we have the individual voltage drops, we can work out the power or watts across each part of the circuit. Using the power triangle, we know that power is equal to the voltage multiplied by the current, or as some say, watts equals volts times amps, a different way of saying the same thing. The first resistance has 6 volts across it and 3 amps flowing through it. 6 times 3 is 18 watts. For the second, it is 12 volts and the same 3 amps to give 36 watts. And lastly, 6 volts and 3 amps to give 18 watts again. The total wattage, the total power in the circuit, is the addition of all these, which is 72 watts. And we can show that this is correct if we take the total circuit voltage and multiply this by the total current. 24 volts times 3 amps is 72 watts. Now we can apply these same methods to my kettle. What happens when I make myself a pot of coffee? Will the kettle work differently depending on how the circuit has been installed. The main question with the voltage drop and the starting point for everything else is if the voltage is 230 volts at the consumer unit then what is it at the socket when the kettle is plugged in? The voltage at the consumer unit will vary from property to property and from hour to hour during the day but we will use the nominal voltage of 230 volts as suggested in the wiring regulations for all of our calculations even though, for many of us, the actual voltage measured will be nearer to 240 volts. We must always begin with fixed values, and it is important to understand just what a fixed value is and what is a variable in any circuit. Let's begin by eliminating the variable values. Power, or watts, is a variable. It is the result of all the other things that are happening in the circuit. A 3 kilowatt kettle is only 3 kilowatts 
if certain conditions are met. Current or amps is also a variable value for the same reasons. You must understand that power or current can only change if something else changes. And the voltage across different parts of the circuit will be variable too as a result of other things changing. As you will see, the voltage at the sockets and points of use can change when something is plugged into them. Note that we cannot change power and make the voltage different. The voltage must change first and then the power will change. And amps cannot change resistance. If the resistance changes, then the amps may change. But we cannot put more amps in and miraculously change the resistance. It does not work that way round. Variables need something else to happen first. So where can we find a fixed voltage? We will assume for our purposes that the voltage at the consumer unit at the entry point of the installation is fixed. In this case, at 230 volts, our nominal voltage. And finally, the resistance is fixed. Some people will argue that this is an impedance because it is an AC waveform, but at 50 cycles per second and at domestic values of current, then the resistance and impedance will be just about the same and this suits these examples perfectly. We're keeping it simple and not getting too technical. So, scenario one. A circuit is protected by a 32 amp MCB and the cross-sectional area or size of the cable is four millimeter twin and earth. A socket has been installed next to the consumer unit and the length of the circuit to this first point is just half a meter. Let's plug our kettle in. As we said, the voltage at the consumer unit is assumed to be fixed at 230 volts. So what is the voltage at the half meter socket and how many watts is our kettle using? We can simplify this circuit, including the kettle, and visualize it as three resistances in series just as before. The line conductor is a resistance of 0.0023 ohms, that's half a meter of four millimeter copper cable. Then the kettle, a 20 ohm resistance, and the neutral conductor, the same value as the line. The total resistance is all three added together, which is 20.0046 ohms. And then there is 230 volts across all of them. Now we can work out the current flowing. Voltage divided by resistance is current. So 230 volts divided by 20.0046 ohms is near enough 11.5 amps. We will round up or down in this video to make the maths easier and to avoid working with far too many decimal places. Now we know the current, 11.5 amps, and this flows through the line conductor, through the kettle element and through the neutral conductor, and with this knowledge we can calculate the individual voltage drop across each part of the circuit. Voltage is I times R, or current, multiplied by resistance, and as shown here, we have a voltage of 0.025 volts across each of the line and neutral conductors. This then leaves 229.95 volts across the kettle. A big fat cable and a very short distance, almost all of the voltage goes into the kettle. And this is the best and most efficient scenario and it will give us the maximum power available. What is this power? Power is voltage times current. So let's calculate individual parts of the circuit again. The power lost in the line conductor is the individual voltage, 0.025 volts, multiplied by 11.5 amps, which is 0.28 watts. The neutral is the same size and length, so the same power at 0.28 watts. This is a total of 0.58 watts of lost power, just over half a watt. But this very low wattage is never going to heat up the cables in the wall and this is about the best we can get, almost ideal. But what about the kettle? This is where we want the energy to be. 229.95 volts multiplied by 11.5 amps is 2644 watts for the kettle. Now we can look at scenario 2. This is the same circuit, the same 32 amp MCB with 4mm twin and earth cable. But this time, we've plugged the kettle into the far socket, 
40 meters from the consumer unit. Again, the voltage at the consumer unit is considered a fixed voltage at 230 volts. But what is the voltage difference now at the 40 meter socket? Here we have a simple sketch and do get used to drawing circuits like this. The simplification really helps in your understanding and in the accuracy of the calculations. 40 meters of 4 millimeter copper conductor is 0 0.1844 ohms for the line and the same for the neutral. The kettle is still 20 ohms and the total then of 20.3688 ohms. But has the power in the kettle changed? Total current as before is V over R. So 230 volts divided by 20.3688 ohms gives us 11.29 amps. This is slightly less current because the line and neutral cables are longer and the resistance has increased. Longer cables, more resistance. Calculate the voltage drop across each resistance. The voltage across the line is 11.29 amps times 0 0.1844 ohms to give 2.1 volts. The neutral will also be 2.1 volts as it is the same size and same length conductor. The voltage across the kettle has now dropped to 225.8 volts. There is now more voltage lost in the cables and less available for the kettle. But the total voltage drop is still only 4.2 volts, well below the permitted 11.5 volts in the regulations book. Now calculate the power, the watts. Voltage times current will give us the watts. For the line conductor, it is 2.1 volts times 11.29 amps, giving a loss of 23.7 watts. And 23.7 watts in the neutral as well, a total of 47.4 watts lost into the wall. The kettle power is 225.8 volts multiplied by 11.29 amps, and this is 2,549 watts of power available to heat up the water. Less voltage and less current means less watts. In scenario 3, there is only a single socket at the end of a 40 meter run of cable. Our unthinking electrician has decided that as it's just one 13 amp socket, a 16 amp breaker will do and, according to the book, one millimeter twin nerve cable will take 16 amps. So let's use up that half empty reel in the back of the van. Here's a picture of the scenario, but is it correct? The resistance of the line and neutral is 0 0.72 ohms for each conductor based on 40 meters of one millimeter copper. And it is still the same kettle at 20 ohms. Our total resistance now is 21.44 ohms. 230 volts divided by 21.44 ohms is a current of 10.73 amps. The thinner cable has had a noticeable effect on the current and this will ripple through in all our other calculations. Calculate our individual voltage drops, I times R and we have 10.73 amps multiplied by 0 0.72 ohms giving us 7.73 volts drop for each of the line and neutral cables. Which means that now there is just 214.5 volts available for the kettle. The total voltage lost in the line and neutral is 15 and a half volts, well above the permitted limit for non-lighting circuits of 11.5 volts. We're already in trouble. And sure enough, when we calculate the power in the different parts we have for the line conductor, 7.73 volts times 10.73 amps, which is 83 watts. The same 83 watts is lost in the neutral, which means that 166 watts of energy is being lost into the cables, into the wall, every time the kettle is turned on. This is lost energy that the customer is paying for. Moving on to the kettle then, the power available is 214.5 volts multiplied by 10.73 amps, and now we find that the power is reduced to just 2,301 watts. Our 2.7 kilowatt kettle is now only functioning as a 2.3 kilowatt kettle. This is a lose-lose scenario. The cables are overheating, the customer is paying for lost power heating up the walls, and the kettle is nowhere near as efficient as it should be. And this is all because 
we use a long, thin cable for the job without doing the calculations first. This little table summarises the main observations for each of these three scenarios. You will be reminded that the longer the circuit, the greater the volts drop in the cable. Conductors with small cross-sectional areas add to this voltage drop. And as the cable resistance increases, the current that can flow will reduce. These factors combine to reduce the power output of the kettle shown by a reduction in watts. And the last line compares the time to boil a litre of water with my kettle. It doesn't seem like a significant increase in time, but somebody has to pay for this, and over a year of usage that could be significant. All appliances will be affected by the examples shown here, showers and cookers especially, and should it be lighting, there may be a noticeable change in light intensity, as will happen with poorly calculated lighting circuits. It's easier to get the circuit right before it's built. Hopefully, this video has helped you to understand how voltage drop can affect a circuit, and that you've put a little more knowledge into your mental toolbox. Here is a short summary of things to consider. If the load is less than the MCB size, the MCB size will have no effect at all on the voltage drop or power in the circuit. We deliberately included the MCB size to show this. The shorter the length and the bigger the CSA, then the greater the power that is available in the circuit. There will be less voltage drop in the cables and more voltage available for the appliance. And this will result in more watts in the appliance and greater efficiency of the appliance. As the length of the circuit increases and the size of the cable reduces, then the voltage drop in the cable increases. More power is lost in the cables and extra heat is generated. The voltage available at the appliance decreases the power in the appliance also decreases and the appliance is less efficient and the customer is paying for this inefficiency. Thank you for watching this video, it is very much appreciated. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. Here are some tips on getting even more information and help out of learnelectrics.com. Out your web browser enter learnelectrics.com into the search bar. Select learnelectrics.com from the choices offered and the website, as shown, will open up for you. You now have a couple of choices. You can search for a help item or any video by entering a keyword into the search bar on the right. Click on Return and all the help files and videos with that word in the title will be listed for you. They will be shown with a short description and each video listed will have a link shown that will take you directly to that exact YouTube video. Or you can browse through a list of all the available items and videos. To do this, click on the LE logo on the top left of the home page and all of our items and videos will be shown. There will be 10 items shown on each page and at the bottom of each page is a page selector, page 2, 3, 4 and so on that will bring up the next 10 items or videos in the list. And don't forget, you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel, don't miss the next one. Once again, thanks for watching, and we hope to see you again very soon.